Fed up with the everyday grind. Tired out from the summer heat. Want to get away from it all. We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are trapped aboard an ill-fated ocean liner, captained by a dying man, while a mysterious stranger, haunting you, menacing you, seems intent on sending you to destruction. Tonight, we escape to mid-ocean and to the strange passengers aboard a stranger ship, as James Gould Cousins tells it in his gripping story, S.S. San Pedro. up from the Hoboken waterfront and drifted in waves across the open bridge deck where I stood. The last few loads of passengers' luggage were being hoisted aboard. In 30 minutes, the whistle on the forward stack would sound off, and the cargo liner San Pedro, carrying 172 passengers and 200 in the crew, would nose away from the pier and start the long run south to Buenos Aires. Then... Then she'd become the great living animal she was meant to be. No longer something built of paint and steel and tied to a pier. You get to feel that way after you've been a while at sea. You feel that your ship is a live thing and that that you're part of it. The captain is the biggest part, of course. The brain of the ship. The mentality that keeps her from turning idiot and dashing herself to pieces in her madness. The officers are the nerve centers and the crew, the hands and fingers... And the twin turbines far down in the hold are the great driving muscles of the legs. Eh, Silly, maybe, but you can feel it. And the passengers, well, uh, to most of us officers, the passengers are the parasites of the ship. My, but you look confident. Huh? I said I'm glad you look confident. But you don't have to look so serious. I'm sorry, miss. The passengers are not allowed on the bridge. I know that. I've been on ships before. And I've never been thrown off a bridge yet. Well, I have no intention of throwing you off, but I must ask My you... My to... name is Mary Lee. How do you do? Are you the captain? No. No, I'm Bradell, the first officer. Oh, the captain's right-hand man. You might put it that way. Now, if you'll please... Mary Lee is my first name. Yeah, I, I assumed as much. Oh, well, I'll just call you Bradell then. Maybe you'll loosen up when we get farther south. I doubt it. At least you'll have to dance with me in the evening part of your duty. Well, I'll be, I'll be happy to, uh, in the line of duty. A regular machine, aren't you? <laughs> I think this is going to be fun. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, please be kind Mr. enough Brunel. to... Yes, Mr. Driscoll, what is it? Captain's compliments, sir. I'd like to see you in his cabin right away. Good. Um, take charge of the bridge, Mr. Driscoll. All right, sir. Most of the luggage is already aboard. Packy's on the winch. She's pretty drunk, but Myro seems to be able to handle them. All right, Mr. Brunel, I'll watch him. And uh, please make sure the young lady finds her way back to the passenger deck. Don't worry, Bradell. I know how to get any place I want to get. You know, deck officers get all the breaks. Who's your little friend, Bradell? Ah, uh, passenger, a cockeyed nuisance. <laughs> you can have her, Sparks. Good. Maybe I can teach her the cold. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> hey, wait till you get a load of the captain's visitor. Brace yourself, boy. Come in. I understand you sent for me, Captain. Oh, Mr. Bradell. Uh, yes, I did, my boy. Everything in order on deck? Yes, sir. We'll sail in about 20 minutes. Good, good, uh, Mr. Bradell. Oh, I'd like to present... Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Percival. How do you do? 
Mr. Brideau. <laughs> I don't wonder at your surprise. My appearance is somewhat strange. I'm, uh, uh, sorry, sir. No, no. I'm quite used to such a reaction. I am well aware that I closely resemble a corpse. <laughs> well, well, uh, Mr. Riddell, I wonder if you'd mind showing Dr. Percival around the ship. Well, uh, Captain Clentenning, we sail in 20 minutes. A very brief tour will show me all I wish to see, Mr. Riddell. Well, maybe after we get underway, I could uh, show No, you no, uh, Dr. Percival isn't sailing with us, Mr. Riddell. It uh, shouldn't take more than a few minutes. I'd show him around myself, but I'm... I'm not feeling too well. A man wears out, I guess. Starts to break down. Like a machine. Uh, like a machine. That's what she said. What, uh, what's that, Mr. Bredo? Uh, uh, nothing, uh, nothing, sir. Well, shall we get started, Dr. Percival? I showed him through the empty dining salon, along the boat deck and the promenade. We opened the bulkhead door and looked down through the gratings into the engine room. And everywhere we walked, people drew back and stared silently until we passed, and then whispered together behind us. We met Marilee, and she started to speak, and then her face turned white, and she passed us without a word. Dr. Percival paid no attention to any of them. His gaunt, gray face never changed expression, and those dark, hollow eyes stared straight ahead. His twisted hands were covered by gloves made of soft, gray leather, and he reached out with them from time to time and touched things as we passed, almost uh, caressing them. It was almost repulsive for some reason. Finally, we wound up at the port rail of the officer's deck, and I showed him how to reach the gangplank. I presume these are the officers' quarters along here, Mr. Bredell? Yes, that's right. The port cabin's here, and the same thing over on the starboard. There are a few spares we use for sick bays when we have to. I see. Nearly 400 people on board. Quite a responsibility. Especially for the captain. Yes, yes, he has his hands full, all right. And if something should happen to him? Oh, well, I'm next in charge, only <laughs> nothing will happen. In what causes that sound? One minute, Mr. Burdell. Right, Myro. Oh, there are the ship's engines. We'll be hearing them for the next ten days. Mm. Mr. Bradell, have you noticed that your ship is not floating level. Huh? This side of the deck, the port side, I think you said, is a good deal lower than the other. Yeah. Yes, we do have a slight list of port. I hadn't noticed it. Well, it's nothing serious. We'll correct it with the ballast tanks as soon as we're underway. Uh, now, sir, if you Mr. Please... Mr. the captain is an old man. He's in bad shape. Well, not according to the ship's doctor. I am his doctor now. Well, I, I don't believe I care to discuss it, sir. Nor I. I only mention it. Thank you, Mr. Bradell, for showing me what I wish to see. I'll be going now. Uh, fine, fine, fine. Uh, glad I've had you aboard. Now, straight down that ladder now. By dinner that evening, we were 140 miles at sea. The sun dropped behind a red haze and brought out a clear, starry night sky. Uh, Marily had somehow wangled a place at my table, but held herself down to an occasional knowing grin that the other passengers probably misinterpreted. Well, I dodged her afterwards, checked over the cargo plant for a while, trying to find some reason for the strange port list that was getting a little more pronounced. And finally, dropped into the wireless shack. Oh, hi, Burdell. Get bored with social life? <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the heat, it's the femininity. <laughs> <laughs> you should squawk. The only time I see a girl on board this tub is when they come in to wire for money at the next port. <laughs> well, I know one you can have. 
And that's just the one I'd take, too. You're crazy, Burdell. <laughs> Maybe. You picked up anything? No. I've been talking to the Toledo. Mm. She's about 100 miles ahead of us, making 17 knots. So we'll probably tailor all the way south. Mm. Yeah. Oh, she started hitting some bad weather about an hour ago. Guess we'll be getting it, too. Probably make all your lady friends seasick. <laughs> Good. And see if you can hurry it up. There's the captain in the chart room. Yeah. Called from there 10 minutes ago. Hey, uh, how'd you like that character that came aboard to see him? Oh, Dr. Percival? Uh -huh. uh, you can have him, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, see you later. Right. I'll let you know if I get any more in the storm. Right. So long. Oh, Mr. Burdell. Huh? Oh, for the... Wait a minute. I wanted to... No, wait. Wait. Uh, good evening, Captain. Oh, uh, Mr. Bridell. I've been writing up the night orders. Uh, who has the first watch? Driscoll? Yes, sir. Then Eberly. Uh, good. Uh, by the way, Mr. Bridell, I appreciate your showing Dr. Percival around this afternoon. Oh, well, I'm glad to do it, Captain. Say, is he um, <clears throat> an old friend of yours? No, uh, no. I met him quite recently. Uh, Mr. Bridell, what's this port list? It's getting worse. Shows eight degrees on the clinometer now. Well, I've had one pump on the ballast tank since three o'clock. Better put on another one. It worries me. Bad weather up ahead, you know. Yes, yeah, so I just talked to Morris. Wonder if we're making any water. Uh, well, I, I don't think so. I'll check with the engine room if you like. Yes, I wish you would. You can't afford to take any chances. Bridell here, McGillbrief. Captain wants your bilge soundings. Call him back. Right. Chart room. I'm I'm tired tonight, Mr. Bridell. Don't feel so well. well. Guess a man's bound to get old sometime. Oh, well, that's still some years ahead of you, sir. I doubt it. Doubt it very much. Well, can't do much about it. Oh, I, I meant to tell you. The steward reported this afternoon that he couldn't get into number seven port cabin on the officer's deck. He couldn't get into it. The door seems to be stuck. Don't know what's wrong. We should look into it. Oh, all right, sir. I'll have Myro look into it. I think he's up on... Ah. That must be the engine room. Bedell. Right. Right. All right, thanks. And McGilvery says all the bilgers are dry, sir. Good. Uh, I... Well... I guess there's no reason why they shouldn't be at that. A man gets old. Yeah, well, um, I'll go to speak to Myro, Captain, and see about putting another pump on the ballast tanks. Good, good. I'm, uh, I'm going to turn in in a few minutes. Good night, Mr. Bridell. Good night, Captain. Well... I knew you'd have to come out sometime. Now, look, miss. Relax, Bradell. You have a terribly romantic profile. We're getting closer to the tropics all the time. I've been there before. Yes, I'll bet you have. Now, listen. If you oh, want to go... Oh, why don't you be human for once? You keep on and you'll end up looking like your ghoulish friend you were showing around this afternoon. He was no friend of mine. There should be a rule against taking passengers who look like that. Oh, it gives me the creeps. Well, for your information, we uh, we didn't take him. He went ashore. Oh, you'd be a good liar, Bradell, if I hadn't seen him myself a half an hour ago. Huh? Where? He went into one of those cabins right down there ahead of us. On the uh, on the officer's deck? Mm-hmm. You, uh, you didn't notice which one. Yes, I did, as a matter of fact. It was number seven. Ah, uh-huh. Seven, huh? All right, come on. Now, look, Bradell, I don't want to meet the guy. I don't want to have anything to do with him. Gave me the shivers just to look at him. Did it? Is this the one? Mm, number seven. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You notice the little crossbar on the door handle? Yes. And it's turned straight up and down? Yes. That means the door's unlocked, huh? All right. But it doesn't open. That's right. Because it's jammed. 
The steward reported it this afternoon, not a half hour ago. So you're not much of a liar yourself. But I saw him go in this door. Oh, sure. I sure tell you, you I did. I saw him. Anything wrong, Mr. Verdell? Oh, Myro. No, no, nothing's wrong. This door is apparently jammed. We should try to get it open while you have a chance. All right, sir. And Myro, when you do, please, um, please advise this young lady. She's very curious about what's inside the cabin. Uh, good night. Mr. Burdell. Uh, Mr. Burdell, uh, wake up. Uh, uh, oh, Myro, Myro, uh, what's the matter? Mr. Driscoll wants you on the bridge, sir. We got some pretty bad weather. Yeah, yeah, I can feel it. How long has it been this way? Well, since midnight, but it's getting worse, sir. Stewart says some glass broke on the promenade deck. We've shipped water in the forward hold. All right, Myro, tell Driscoll I'll be on the bridge in five minutes. Get going. It was fairly bad on deck. Dawn was just breaking, with light enough to make out the long, high swells charging into us one after another, the tops of their crests ripped and torn by the driving wind. We were taking them on the quarter, rolling pretty badly and shipping water on the port bow at every roll. And if anything, that list had grown worse during the night. Oh. Glad you're here, Mr. Brudell. Having a rather bad go of it. Yeah, yeah, well, we've seen worse. Has the captain been called? No, sir, I thought I'd better wait for you. Right, no need to call him. Yeah. Where's Eberly? Took some men down to the forward hold. Yeah. We're shipping water on the port side every yeah, time. Yeah, we... yeah, I know, I know. Uh, Myro, see if you can get him on the phone. Yes. Yeah. Good Lord. Well, we're listing 11 degrees now. Are those pumps still going in the ballast tanks? All night, sir. The tanks are two-thirds empty now. I can't understand it. I think the phone is dead in the forward hold, Mr. Burdell. I can get no signal. All right, Myro. You go on down there and see what the trouble is. Report back. Yes, sir. Huh. Eleven degrees. Huh. Can't see any reason why we... Oh, I'll take it, sir. Driscoll here. Yes, I know. I know. All right, I'll speak to him. McGilvery says they're taking quite a beating in the engine room. Wants to know if we can't slack off this roll. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'd better. No use beating ourselves to death against those swells. Glenn Denning here. Riddell, Captain, sorry to bother you. It's all right, boy. What is it? Permission to change course, sir. We're taking a bad swell on our quarter. Granted. Whatever you think best. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, need me for anything? No. No, sir. I I'll report later. All right, Mr. Driscoll, new course. Yes, sir. Ease off 14 degrees and then hold due south. Ease off 14 degrees, hold due south. Aye, sir. I'm going to the wireless room. All right, sir. Uh, we ought to be out of this by afternoon. It's windy, isn't it? Marley, what the devil are you doing on deck? Getting rained on, mostly. Haven't you got any sense? We're shipping water on the foredeck. You want to get washed over? Would you care, Bradell? Look, it costs money to stop a ship. Now, listen. Get below. I'm still waiting to see inside number seven cabin. Well, Bradell. <laughs> They're kind of shaking us well before using, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, just change the course. Should ease this roll a little. Uh, Morris, what's the nearest ship to us? Still the Toledo, uh, about uh, 70 miles south. They say it's raining down there. Can you imagine? Uh, there's nothing any any closer, huh? Well, nothing that I've been able... Hey, you don't figure we're... No, 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 there's no danger, Morris. Just, just routine. Well, I'll see what I can pick up. Static's not making it... Oh. Morris. Yeah, he's here. It's for you. Oh, uh, thanks. Bedell speaking. Driscoll, sir. Yeah? McGilvery just called. Wants permission to put all pumps to work on the bilge. On the bilge? What for? Says we're making water from somewhere. He's got 40 inches in the stoke hole. Uh, it's probably coming from that forward hole. Well, as soon as Everly gets the bulkhead closed, we'll be able to... Wait a, wait a, wait a second. Hold on. Myro just came in. 
What'd you find out? Uh, Mr. Everly needs more men, sir. Some of those big crates shifted. They knocked out most of the forward bulkhead. Knocked out? Mr. Driscoll? Yes, sir. Call the captain and ask him to meet me on the bridge immediately. hours were a nightmare. All through the day, into the evening, terrified passengers huddled in the lounges in the salon, not knowing just how great the danger might be and fearing the worst. At 11 a.m., one of the pumps broke down, and the San Pedro settled a little lower as the water gained in the bilges. At 1.30, pump back in operation, and for a while we held our own. Down in the forward hole, men fought a heartbreaking battle in water up to their armpits and tried to throw up a temporary bulkhead. At 5.15, a heavy sea crashed through the steward's pantry and six men vanished overboard in a smother of foam. All night long, we fought the sea and lost the battle foot by foot. The strange list to port grew worse. By dawn, we were leaning over 18 degrees and shipping tons of water with every roll. Driscoll here. Right. All right, hold on. Mr. Bradell. Yeah, what is it, Driscoll? McGilvery on the phone, sir. Says he's had to pull the fire in one boiler, he's going to in the second one. Wants to know if you'll reduce speed to steerage way, otherwise he hasn't got steam enough for the pumps. All right, tell him yes. McGilvery, Bradell says okay. Take it now. One-third speed. All right, Helm. Speed to one-third. Hey, sir. Confound it, sir. Captain ought to be here on the bridge. Been in this cabin for the last four hours. He's got no business to stay. That'll do, Mr. Driscoll. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry, sir. Ah, forget it. You're right at that. We haven't got much time to make up our minds. Well, how are the passengers, Myro? Fair morale, sir. The stewards are trying to keep them calm. They're all in life preservers. Yeah, the way we're heeled over, we can't use the starboard boats now. And in another hour, there won't be enough steam for the winches on the port side. Well. Hello. Uh, hello. Oh, what the devil? Now the captain's phone's dead, too. Myro. Yes, Mr. Burdell? Go down to the captain's cabin. Ask him to come up. Yes, sir. We can't chance it any longer, Driscoll. At least we can start a call out while the captain's on his way here. All right. Morris here. Riddell on the bridge. You still sending CQ? Yes, sir. Repeats at five minutes. You picked up anything? The Toledo. There's a canard liner a hundred miles north. Yeah, that's not much help. How bad off are we, sir? Bad enough you can start sending an SOS now. Give me position on anything you pick up and stand by for further orders. Right, sir. Uh, this is it, then. Well, what else, Mr. Driscoll? It may be too late as it is. Mr. Riddell. Yes, Myro? The captain, sir. He's in his bunk. Dead. Good Lord. Well, well, he was right then. Men get old. Machines wear out. I think he's been dead for some time, Mr. Bedell. Probably so. Myro, did you, uh... Did you ever get that port cabin door open? I didn't have any chance, sir. But what difference does it make now? None. None, I guess. I just wondered. All right, Mr. Driscoll. Yes, sir. Put a general order on the PA. Emergency. All officers stand by boat stations. Prepare to abandon ship. Yes, sir. Now? Go ahead. Attention. All officers, stand by boat stations. Prepare to abandon ship. All officers, stand by boat stations. Prepare to abandon ship. All officers, stand by boat Her brain already gone. Ship was dying. I knew that. I stayed alone on the bridge, tried to quiet her death throes, tried to hold back the confusion of idiocy that shook her limbs and parts. The wind was gone now, and a thick gray fog blanketed the decks and the sea beyond. Boats were lowered and swallowed up in it, one by one. Some of them lowered poorly to spill their human freight into the hungry, wet mouth of the sea. We were low in the water, down at the head, already the bows were awash. But suddenly I, I noticed that the strange list of port was, was no longer with us. 
Why, we were floating level. And then for, for no sane reason, I wondered if the changed angle had let the door of number seven cabin swing open. I left the bridge and hurried forward. door was ajar and swung gently with the movement of the ship. I pushed it open and stepped into the cabin. It was empty. In the air was a strange, dry, musty smell, like old flowers long pressed in the pages of a book. At that moment, I turned, and the water was moving slowly toward me up the passageway. I heard Myro shout the order for casting off the last boat. I left the cabin, ran for the bridge. Hello, Bridell. Huh? Marilee. Glad to see me. Oh, do you know the last boat just went over the side? Sure. I was about to get in the boat. Then I changed my mind. Why? When it's your time, you can't do much about it. And I knew what it was when he first looked at me. Ah, uh, what are you talking about? When, when who looked at you? That guy you called, Dr. Percival. He's not on board. I just came from cabin seven. It's empty. Of course it is. Now. He's out prowling around the boat somewhere. I saw him go ashore before we left New York. And I saw him three minutes ago. <sighs> You're crazy. He was standing beside that lifeboat. The one I didn't get in. That lifeboat was your last chance to live. Why didn't you take it? I thought it wouldn't be so lonesome to come here and die with you. But you wouldn't have died. Oh, Bredell, don't you know yet? It wouldn't have made any difference no matter what we did. Not with Dr. Percival on board. What has Dr. Percival got to do with it? Everything. When that lifeboat hit the water, it capsized. I knew it would. <laughs> so you see, I'd have died anyway. Adele, the water's coming up faster now. Yeah, it's sinking fast. We'll go under any second. He must be on his way here. We should be hearing his footsteps. Who in the name of heaven is Dr. Percival? Who do you think he is? Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Tonight, we have brought you S.S. San Pedro by James Gould Cousins, adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Featured in tonight's cast were John Daner and Charlotte Lawrence, with Jeff Corey, Don Diamond, Harry Bartell, Larry Dobkin, and Jay Novello. Special music by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, you are standing in the light of an arc lamp by a cathedral in Mexico City looking at a body lying in the grass. And then a great fear comes over you, and you wonder if you are a haunted man. Next week, we escape with Ralph Bates' most unusual story, The Haunted Man. Good night, then, until this same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.